how can we solve this problem? How can we write something up that will impact policy and drive change in schools or in the workplace? We did the, a very similar study, just got published, for garment workers in Bangladesh. You know, for me, that's super exciting because now that's impacting their workspace and they're improving their productivity and again, to improving their take-home pay. You're listening to Parallax from Radcliffe Cardiology in association with makeadent.org. Here is your host, Ankur Kalra, MD. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to another episode of Parallax. So uh, this is um, sort of an interesting detour for us. It's a detour for us because, uh, you know, we've hosted guests who are cardiologists and we've hosted patients who have underlying cardiac conditions. Uh, but this is a unique episode because um, the gentleman who is our guest on the show today is uh, none of the aforementioned. He actually is an ophthalmologist. Uh, he's an ophthalmologist who is with Orbis International. Um, um, Orbis International has garnered tremendous attention within ophthalmology and also global ophthalmology. And he's going to tell us more about Orbis. He's going to tell us about Cybersight. Um, but what's even more interesting is the fact that um, we just um, got to know each other, you know, a few hours ago, and we, we literally just hit it off. And we have a lot of, um, uh, you know, goals and, and missions that are aligned. And, you know, how we view life and how we view the world is is congruent and um you know i just invited him to be on parallax and you know he graciously agreed to my invitation so with that introduction dr hunter chervek uh, from orbis international and um you know from cybersite welcome on the show and welcome on parallax and thank you so much for doing this for us no, oh, it's fantastic like i said it was such an incredible conversation we had we talked about art poetry medicine, medical training. So I was really honored and privileged that you gave me the opportunity to catch up tonight and talk more on your podcast. Um, absolutely. So the reason I actually bring, uh, you know, I brought you on the show and I, I sort of wanted to share your, uh, your journey and your expertise with our listenership um, is because, uh, you know, it, obviously thinking outside the box, thinking big, um, innovation and leaving a footprint in the global space. Um, and I know we talked about equity, we talked about education, we talked about environment. And, you know, all these are themes which resonate so deeply with me and they resonate so deeply with um, the principles and foundational basis of my nonprofit, makeadent.org which happens to also co-host this podcast with Ratcliffe. And so, you know, I, I thought these are interesting themes, particularly around technology and artificial intelligence and education that we can learn from you as cardiologists and sort of, you know, implement these themes and these ideas in our jobs, in our professions, in our careers. So uh, what, what do you have to say about that, uh, Hunter? Yeah, I mean... You know, what's really exciting is how technology has allowed us to democratize education and globalize impact. And no matter where you're practicing, and I'm in the middle of nowhere, Virginia, on the Chesapeake Bay, you're in Indiana, but we may be reaching viewers all around the world. And that's something that drew me to Orbis. When I first joined, I finished my residency. I turned in my pager back when that was a thing. And four hours later, I was on a flight to China. And I was with our Flying Eye Hospital. It's a U.S. accredited eye uh, hospital that's also a teaching center on board an MD-10 aircraft that was donated by FedEx. But at that same time, a pediatric ophthalmologist who actually practiced at Indiana University, where you are now, Dr. Gene Hevelston, started an incredible telemedicine distance mentorship program called Cybersight. And we've been going now for almost 20 years. We're in every country in the world, except for North Korea and Western Sahara. And we have over 60,000 registered users. We have everything from free webinars and courses, much like you offer here, but we also offer expert consultation and actually 
AI assisted consultation, where instead of using artificial intelligence for machine learning and try to extract as much data as possible from different geographic regions, we actually use our algorithms to teach and show differential diagnosis and help take a user through the back of the eye image, the retina, to show vascular disease, optic nerve head anomalies, things like that. And so I think where you and I hit it off quite well was we're both right at that edge of how do you maximize impact through technology and how do you build capacity, especially in the areas of the world that need it most? Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, so um, I, I just want to, you know, delve a little bit more into the journey of Orbis and CyberSight and how much it has grown over the past couple of decades. And what I want to ask you in particular is some of the challenges and roadblocks. I, I don't like to use that word because, you know, I think each time you meet an obstacle, it's just a detour. It's sort of, you know, like how Ryan Holiday says that the obstacle is the way. It's the stoic philosophy and the stoic principles of thinking. Um, so I don't like to use that word, but I'm I'm sure you would have encountered or met with challenges and and you still kept growing. And, you know, now you have just an enormous footprint in the ophthalmology space. Uh, but tell us, you know, maybe one through three or one through five, like like top three or top five, you know, obstacles or redirection in your path that, you know, you did not foresee as you were, um, you know, taking this journey and you were on this path. But looking back, you know, you, you now know how you navigated that that challenge. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm definitely someone who's made a million mistakes, but view them as lessons. And I certainly, when I graduated high school, never thought I'd be traveling around the world and working with the best volunteer surgeons from the best universities and learning each day. For me, it's just about learning, having that humility and realizing none of us are perfect. And really, as you said, the obstacle is the way. You know, if it were easy, everyone else is doing that. What really is going to differentiate your career and the impact of your organization you're doing something novel, you're really solving and bringing value to a problem or a community. And that's what I love about, you know, Orbis. We're, we're bringing, you know, everyone has been impacted in one way or another by vision, whether or not it's needing glasses or a grandparent having cataract surgery or a child needing strabismus surgery. I, I definitely think all of us are connected through vision. And for me, it's incredibly exciting to go and now having done this now for almost, you know, 15, 20 years, where you go back to communities and the residents you taught, you know, are now the professors and they're opening up fellowships in country. So for me, that's the real thing that I focus on is kind of the legacy and not the immediate, you know, challenge, because to me, that's what makes this job exciting and bringing in new talent and new technology to solve that challenge is what gets me out of bed every day. Yeah, no, excellent. I mean, I couldn't agree with you more um, that, you know, vision is, 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 incredibly important of course uh but just you know i don't i don't mean to sound cliched but you know the poet in me and we sort of talked about this when we were you know having our our conference call earlier in the day um and that is the you know the eye is the window to the heart right like that's the poet in me and so you know obviously uh vision and eyes are are crucial and you're doing such noble work through innovation that it, you know, it's it's compelling to to hear your story and hear from you directly as to how you got there. So you know, I I want to now maybe you know tell us, educate us, or explain to us what exactly you meant when you said AI assisted cons you know consults or consultative ophthalmology. Yeah. What what is what is that space and what exactly do you mean when you say consultative ophthalmology through AI? Yeah, it's a great question. I apologize. Uh, you know, one of the things, so on CyberSight, we offer three things, consults, courses, and content. We have live content through interactive webinars, which will reach and have over 100 countries participating live, and static content in our library. Under the consult service, it is not a grandparent asking about their grandchild's glasses. It's an in-country expert with an incredibly difficult case or surgery ahead of them and wanting to consult one of our 400 volunteer faculty from around the world. So for example, we'll have, we've now managed over uh, 950 cases of retinoblastoma 
an ocular cancer in children with St. Jude's Hospital and Toronto Sick Kids Hospital um, and are now managing an oncology service remotely. Well, with artificial intelligence, we are now able to look at the retina and the optic nerve and the macula. And within less than 30 seconds, we're able to highlight all the pathology that the doctor or the referring um, ophthalmologist uh, needs to see. And we go through the classification. So literally when you and I were on the call today, we had an article accepted in a peer reviewed journal about our randomized clinical trial in Rwanda. I could not be more proud that our team led by Dr. Chiku Matenge, who's an incredible force of nature, she opened her own residency program and works with me at Orbis. She led her first ever uh, clinical trial with our team and brought CyberSight artificial intelligence to Rwanda. And the results are just spectacular. So one of the things that I would say, I definitely think the future of medicine, either in education, diagnostics, or care, is going to be driven by uh, technology. And what really is going to make the big difference is how you can visualize how to globalize that technology. I'm not interested in pushing the apex of the pyramid higher. I want to reach that bottom billion. I want to find ways that we can really drive significant change into residency programs in low to middle income countries or at the point of care or the point of diagnosis um, in rural areas, for example, in Rwanda, where now patients can go and have a photo of the back of their eye and know within 30 seconds if they have diabetes, macular disease, glaucoma. And it's incredibly powerful to have the patient look at the photo and have the machine circle or highlight the abnormalities. When a patient sees blood on the back of their eye from the diabetic retinopathy, they know that there's a problem. And we are, we are now showing that it definitely improves compliance and referral to a treatment center. I don't like an artificial intelligence that just does, you know, diagnose and adios. I want the AI to be connected to a mentorship opportunity or a patient care opportunity. And for me, that's what CyberSight AI is all about. Yeah, so uh, can you delve for the cardiology audience and, you know, for those who are listening who are, you know, including myself, who's extremely in tune and very keen about learning more as to how you do that, sort of the nuts and bolts of how you employ AI in, in for example, conducting a randomized clinical trial or, you know, for the examples that you just shared with us, how, what are the nuts and bolts and, and sort of like if you can enumerate the steps for us, because, you know, maybe some of the listenership who's tuning in is naive to this concept. Yeah. And, and, and I think, you know, all of us are learning um, about artificial intelligence. One of the things for ophthalmology, but it's going to be the same for cardiology with echocardiograms or other things where with it, your system and your algorithm is only as good as the data sets that were used to train it. And one of the things I do not like to create digital divides in healthcare, I also now with artificial intelligence do not want to create data divides where your algorithms were only trained with patient populations from a small segment of the world. So our, our AI is not only the first freely available AI for ophthalmologists in the world and to be used in a very uh, controlled setting with uh, oversight from our mentors, it also has data training from around the world. So what is possible now is a technician anywhere in the world can take a photo of the patient's eye and that image, the back of the eye, can be uploaded to our CyberSight platform, C-Y-B-E-R-S-I-G-H-T dot org. And the doctor who's registered can enable the AI service when they're consulting. And so, for example, if they are doing a mass screening for diabetic retinopathy, one of the things that's always a tragedy is if the machine is only looking for diabetes. Our algorithms are also looking for glaucoma, macular disease, and other retinal or disc anomalies. So we use AI and on our, on our already existing consult service where fundus or retina photos can be screened and read by the AI and then highlighted to show the referring doctor where there may be any pathology. 
So just like, and the same is going to be true for radiology, dermatology, echocardiograms, where literally the machine is going to be able to highlight murmurs or wall thickness or ejection fraction anomalies that especially a learning doctor may not have. We, I've worked in many, many hospitals where, you know, there's more residents than attendings. And really, there's no one supervising or uh, really, uh, you know, teaching the residents in a standardized way. One of the beautiful things about AI is it's the algorithms are extremely standardized and you can actually use them to show where disease is and how to interpret that and how to use those data to stage a patient's diabetic retinopathy or glaucoma. Yeah, no, that, that's, a, that's a terrific explanation. And, you know, thank you for uh, taking us through the steps of how it's done. And for someone who is still skeptical about the power of artificial intelligence or the applicability of artificial intelligence in 2022, what do you have to say to those people? No, I, I think that's healthy. I think all change should be viewed with skepticism. I do not worship upon the altar of cybersight. I like healthy debate. I enjoy, you know, compliments are nice, but they don't make you better. I like when people challenge how we do something. It's the referring doctors from around the world that tell us what we need to do better that makes our product better. I do think artificial intelligence will be part of the diagnostic programs going forward, but I do not think it will replace doctors. I think it will be a force enabler, improve referrals, and actually help where, you know, you can get an expert like yourself now available around the world. You know, that's the thing that I really like about CyberSight is we can give a webinar from, for example, our pediatric ophthalmologist in Indiana University. His name's Dan Neely. He's a brilliant teacher. I've worked with him all around the world on our flying eye hospital, on more remote locations. He does incredible chalk talks. Well, you know, when it's only six or seven residents at IU, that's a very limited audience and impact. We put that same webinar and allow it to interact with our cybersite community. He now has 80 countries. He's working in Syria where I've worked many times in the past, but right now we're not able to travel there. He's still connecting with those doctors and giving, you know, consults and teaching. So for me, I'm, I, I don't view technology in a blind fashion. I don't just accept it. I definitely think it needs to go through, you know, FDA, IRB approvals, all of that. It is really exciting. I mean, there's never been a better time to be in ophthalmology. Ophthalmology is the first field of all of medicine to have FDA approval for gene therapy and also now autonomous AI, where the algorithm and the machine is never reviewed or overseen by a human being. Those studies, we're doing some of those, are extremely exciting, but we need to control them. We need to look at the research. We need to look at the data and make sure it truly is bringing value and benefit and is not just the shiny thing that we're going to chase for a few years until the next big thing in buzzword pops up in medicine. I don't think that gene therapy is a fad. I think it is something that we're going to use more and more, but I think we need to be careful with how we study it. And the same is true with artificial intelligence. Yeah. So I think that's a, it's a great segue for us to talk about the study that you brought up when we were having our conference call. And that was the study on, um, Assamese in, in India. Uh, do you want to talk about that work? Absolutely. Um, and, and, and as we discussed, that's, it's one of the most beautiful places in India. The tea plantations are the most green you'll ever see in the world, uh, even more green than Ireland. And uh, they have rhinos. A lot of people, I showed them my photos from places in India, and they don't believe me that there's lions in India. And I'm like, of course there are. And they don't believe me that there are rhinos in India. So that state is a very special state. Well, in that state, it's, as you well know, there's tremendous amounts of tea picking. And what uh, about 95% of the tea, picker, pick, tea pickers are women. And one of the things we did was a randomized clinical trial. It's called PROSPER, P-R-O-S-P-E-R. And you can Google that and find the article in Lancet Global Health. And we actually looked for the first time in all of medicine about a healthcare intervention and not how it impacted a direct health measure, but how it impacted productivity. Take-home pay for these largely women in, uh, picking tea all day long. And especially after the age of 40, by correcting their near vision or presbyopia, we improved their productivity by 20%. And 
and tea pickers over 50, we improve their productivity by 30%. Who would not, especially as a corporation or as an employer, not want to spend a few dollars on their employees per year and improve their productivity by 20 or 30 percent. Of course, we also looked at how we impacted their vision and other metrics, but I'm really proud of that study. For me, it's great to do very complex technology and randomized clinical trials with the latest and greatest medicines and biologics and you know all of those things, but don't forget some of the best innovation is simple. That's what I love about Steve Jobs and the iPhone. Your iPhone has three buttons. Simplicity has beauty in it. And that's one of the things I love about our research. And as you rightly said at the start of this podcast, all of our research is tied to education, economics, or equity. So in that paper, what we wanted to show was how vision could impact the patient's productivity or the participant's productivity and their take-home pay, but then also their family and community economics. And we use all of our research to not only convince, you know, employers or schools to make changes to policies or rules, but then we also go to ministers of health, presidents of countries, and show them the power uh, and how we affect disability-adjusted life years and quality-adjusted life years through eye care interventions. Ophthalmology is an incredibly powerful, you know, field where a five minute surgery and the next day you take off a patch and the patient went from not being able to see and legally blind to literally being able to drive a car the next day. So it is incredible to me where, you know, so many people, I didn't know a lot about ophthalmology when I was going through med school. Of course, everyone knows the major fields, cardiology and, you know, pulmonology and nephrology. Really, I find that ophthalmology is is not well known. But I can tell you, having been in this space for a while now, its impact globally is incredible. You can do cataract surgery without electricity. And I've worked with some of the best surgeons from around the world who who literally are doing more than 100 cataract surgeries a day. And there's no greater joy than post-ops and literally taking off a patch off 100 people's faces and watching each one of them light up and see them connect with their family, the world, literally, like you said, I know as a cardiologist, you said the eye is the window to the heart. I've always said the eye is the window to the soul. And you can just see that life and that mind and that smile light up literally within a nanosecond of taking off that patch. Yeah, no, just, um, you know, w- what a story with, with with Prosper and with Lancet Global Health. And, you know, just congratulations on, you know, not only on doing um a, a very innovative study, but, you know, sort of doing it methodically and sort of then getting it published in Lancet Global Health, which, you know, you know, quite frankly, is, has got a, has got a very significant impact factor. So, you know, I, I, which uh, sort of, you know, both fascinates me and sort of also brings me in awe of the kind of work that you've done through these years is, you know, you've sort of been at the leading edge of innovation but you've also been at the leading edge of science in terms of disseminating what you've learned through innovation by then going through the grind of putting it together in a peer reviewed manuscript format, which both you and I know is, is a daunting ask and then getting these published in high impact journals, you know, just, you know, just commendable job and congratulations and more power to you. But, Again, you know, getting back to the nuts and bolts of how you sort of the execution and the implementation science of what you do. For someone who's listening or someone who wants to follow your footsteps or, you know, wants to come up with their own path, and that's totally fine. You know, each one of us has their own path. But but, but sort of wants to learn the nuts and bolts of how to get this done in terms of implementing it and executing it. What do you have to share and and say about how you got something as beautiful as Prosper, you know, executed on ground in India, in Assam, and then sort of, you know, taking the data with you, curating it properly and putting it together in the form of a peer-reviewed manuscript. How do you do that? Yeah, I, I would say it's not, it's not how I did that or how you do that. It's how our team, we have an incredible team in India. And one of the things I love, you know, our port program portfolio, we have a research department, we have an artificial intelligence department. 
I get to work with some of the best and brightest minds. I am not the sharpest knife in the drawer. I tell everyone and everyone thinks I'm kidding. I don't know the difference between mean, median and mode most days, but I get to work with incredible statisticians and researchers. I think what I'm pretty good at is connecting and coordinating really, really talented people. I have a pretty good eye for talent. And for me, what makes me happy is learning and being around really, really smart people like yourself and learning through conversations like we did earlier today. I love field work. That's kind of my specialty. And so I'm really good at finding talented people like our, our director of research, Dr. Nathan Congdon, or you know Jenna Patnick at the University of Colorado. These are people who are just awesome human beings who just happen to be brilliant researchers. And we sit down and we talk about how can we solve this problem? How can we write something up that will impact policy and drive change in schools or in the workplace? We did the, a very similar study, just got published, for garment workers in Bangladesh. You know, for me, that's super exciting because now that's impacting their workspace and they're improving their productivity and again, to improving their take-home pay. So I think for me, if, especially for someone young or early in their career who wants to be involved with global health, I would say do it, don't talk about it, and do it with really smart people who are great mentors and have the same culture or beliefs that you do. So for me, I, I, one of the quotes I, I've always heard in my life is, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. I would say in your professional life, show me your mentors and I'll show you your legacy or your path. And I've been really, really lucky. Like I said, Dr. Gene Hevelston at your university in Indiana, you know, he was one of the first people I ever worked with. And I mean, he literally wrote the textbook, designed instruments. And you can't spend enough time with someone like that. And you just osmose their energy, their passion, and how they see the world. And again, not to play the I theme or the ophthalmology theme, but that's what I love about my job is like, I get to see the same problem through different hospital systems, different surgeons. I get to see how they do cataract surgery in Nepal or how they do it in Southern India or how they do that in Western Africa. It's just super exciting to have this opportunity to see things from different angles and work with just amazingly talented, kind people. I think the silliest question to ask someone these days is, are you happy? For me, happiness is being in the moment. And as soon as you ask me that question, you take me out of the moment to think about it. The right question to ask someone is, are you surrounded by good people? Are you learning and growing every day? And are you doing something meaningful? And for me, Orbis and CyberSight answers all three of those questions 100%. Yeah, no, you answered that question beautifully. Um, and I, I, I couldn't agree with you more, you know, when people ask, you know, are you happy? You know, like it, it sort of it sort of takes you out of the moment. And, you know, here you are pondering, you know, about the past or contemplating the future. And that's exactly the point of not how to live your life, right? Like you have to live your life in the moment. And, you know, I, I, you know, again, you know, talking about aligning of values and how we see the world and how we see our lives. You know, I think if you, if you surround yourself with people who, you know, are constantly pushing the envelope and if you're surrounding yourself with people who are smarter than you, right? Like if, you know, as they say, you know, like if you are the smartest in the room, you're in the wrong room. Um, so, you know, always surrounding yourself with people who are smarter than you. Um, and who are uh, change makers who sort of see the world um, as you see it and, and you know want to want to foster change and do work that is meaningful that is impactful that you know touches lives that changes lives you know that's the kind of people you want to surround yourself with and, and be around and because you know that's when you'll find you know of, you know of course there're going to be challenges you know who does not have challenges right but then those challenges will bring so much meaning to your life and you know those obstacles will bring so much meaning and joy to your existence and you'll find that special place um in your soul in your heart where you know you you'll feel like you know life is a dance and you know you're you're on the dance floor uh, you know that's how, that's at least how i see it you know through this conversation and obviously 
you know, through the work that you've done, which is just like incredible work. And it just makes me so happy um, that, you know, there's someone out there who's actually doing such incredible work in, in literally changing lives and, and changing livelihoods and, and, you know, bringing so much meaning to their work. It's just, it's just infectious to, to speak with someone like you. Um, so moving forward, um, if I were to ask you and, you know, or, and I, I know this, this is like asking, uh, you know, a parent who their favorite child is. And I, I don't mean to do that, but if I were to ask you to pick your top three or, you know, maybe your top five um, endeavors uh, or projects that you've done around the globe and you, you have such a global footprint. It's, it's incredible. Um, what, what would, what would those projects or those endeavors be? Yeah. And I don't think it's my footprint. I wear a size nine. I'm not a, a big guy. I, I think it's the organization and our networks imprint. So, you know, footprint, you know, for example, we have a full-time staff in Ethiopia who it's over 70 people who all day long, they're distributing antibiotics in Southern Ethiopia to eliminate an infectious cause of blindness called trachoma. And, you know, it's caused by chlamydia bacteria. Uh, Pfizer supports the donation. Those people are my heroes. And, you know, it would be incredible in my lifetime to say that we helped eliminate a disease from the face of the earth. It was in Ireland until the 1950s, and our Orbis Ireland office fundraises exclusively to help eliminate this scourge of the planet, trachoma. If you look at the movie The Godfather 2, when Don Corleone is coming through the turnstiles at Ellis Island, they're flipping his eyelids looking for trachoma. We had this problem. This is a disease that's been around for hundreds and thousands of years. And what's super exciting is, you know, if you ask, ask me what I'm proud of, it's eliminating the disease and being part of a team that's doing that. And it's still going to take a few more years. But if I, God willing, live to be, you know, retirement age, it would be really cool to say that I was part of a team that eliminated a blinding cause of, of, of an infectious cause of blindness that's been on the planet for hundreds and thousands of years. So I, I would say that's one is the public health of eliminating uh, trachoma. Certainly the technology portfolio, we have the Flying Eye Hospital, putting in a, a US accredited hospital. We do general anesthesia when we land and set up in hospital mode, and we can do literally any eye surgery except for LASIK and refractive surgery anywhere in the world. When that Orbis plane lands and we convert into hospital, the only thing we ask of our partners are for stairs, patients who need our help, and doctors and nurses that wanna work with us on board the Flying Eye Hospital Conference. But also, like I said, the cyber site, we're building low cost simulators. We're right now running a randomized clinical trial in seven countries, looking at a low cost, high fidelity cataract simulator that uses the Oculus headset and very fundamental gaming equipment like video games and teaching people how to do cataract surgery. So they see one on cyber site, they sim one with our simulator, and then they go and do the surgery with one of our volunteers or our faculty or one of our residency programs. That's super exciting that like literally you're taking technology like artificial intelligence or simulation, which of course they've used in aviation for years and bringing those to low to middle income countries and giving them as rigorous and as supervised and standardized training as you'd get anywhere in the United States, the UK, you know, other places in the world. So I think I'm really a, a proud of how our organization and our team have democratized technology. And then I guess the last thing that I, I, I spoke about earlier, it's really, really, really cool to go back. And I'm sure you've seen this as an educator and see how the residents you've trained are now pushing the envelope and doing things you never thought you would do or they would do when you were, they were struggling with their first cataract case and you're sitting there in the wet lab late at night trying to get them to hold the instruments correctly. And now they're operating, you know, like a, a true master surgeon. So if you ask me what I think our organization's proud of is globalizing technology, democratizing education, and eradicating or eliminating the, a disease like trachoma, 
so that you know there's not needless avoidable blindness on this planet you know, 75% of the world's blindness could be right now treated or prevented. And 90% of that is in low to middle income countries. And a disproportionate amount of that affects women and young girls. And so gender is a huge part of what we do. We're actually about to submit the largest review article ever looking at gender and blindness. We just submitted last month. And again, this is our research team, not me. Uh, you know, we have a, an incredible team that does the research, but I, you know, talked about, hey, we need to look at how vision in children impacts their uh, mental health. I think mental health has become an incredibly important thing during the COVID pandemic. Well, you know, it's interesting. We, we've we done some studies that are now showing this about how for children, strabismus or misalignment of the eyes, a severe myopia or refractive errors is leading to depression, anxiety. We're showing how it's impacting their educational performance. So it really is exciting when you move and realize that the eye is connected to the brain and that's connected to a human who's connected to a family and how you can undo a lot of that vicious cycle, whether it's with blindness or mental health or education with a very quick surgery that we can teach you know, very well with our fellowships and our hospital programs. So in a long about way, I would just say it's never been about me. I'm not God's gift to anything except maybe my mom. Uh, she would be the only one who would say that. But uh, I would say that we have created an incredible platform with our technology and we have literally the best volunteers. These are not people who want to do good. These are literally people who are true subject matter experts. They're thought leaders. They're chairing departments, leading clinical trials creating new devices and new surgeries and new medicines and biologics. And every day after a 12 or 14 hour day in the field, I get to sit down and have dinner with them and ask them what's next and what are they doing and how do you balance life and family or where's your next vacation? Literally Orbis is the best finishing school for anyone I could think of for global ophthalmology. That, that, that was, that was, that was great. So thank you for sharing that with us and, and with the listenership. But, you know, more, more importantly, um, what I was saying was that it's just infectious to hear you because the enthusiasm is, is osmotic. You know, like you said, you learn through osmosis, you know, it's just, it, it, it percolates and it's, it's, um, it's infectious and, um, it's, it's all pervasive, I guess, you know, with, with, with the team, perhaps even your team members, uh, shared the same, um, you know, feedback with you. Um, so no, congratulations for everything you've done with Orbis, with CyberSight, uh, you know, and the idea of showcasing someone like you and your work to the listenership in Parallax, um, you know, is to sort of derive inspiration from you and learn lessons from you as to how, you know, we could probably do this in, in cardiovascular disease or cardiology. Any closing remarks, um, Hunter, for the podcast, for the listeners and and for the audience at large? Well, no, I mean, I first want to say thank you for your time today. I very much enjoyed both of our conversations in the last 12 hours. Um, I would definitely tell you that all of us, all of us have been connected through health these days with environmental change, with the pandemic, and all of us are practicing global medicine, whether it's ophthalmology, cardiology, internal medicine. I would say, and I think this appeals to kind of you as the artful cardiologist, as I've now coined you, um, I definitely think understanding the journey your patients have been on and realizing that the person in your chair, you know, now you are running a global office. You will treat someone in your practice who has, you know, come from Ghana or Ethiopia or Argentina or Jordan. And the more you can educate yourself and connect with those patients and their journey and understand the challenges they face, I think it just makes you a better physician. So I, I do think there is value to understanding global work and global affairs. And then the last thing is obviously people like you, you're changing the world. I mean, you're, you're finding new ways to teach and new ways to innovate. I, I would challenge any of your listeners to always be thinking of that bottom billion of the world population. And can you make a device? Can you make a, 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 treatment that reaches the people who need it most. I would challenge you to always think globally when you're designing things and not trying to 
you know, design something that just iterates on a, a very expensive uh, procedure or technology? Can you simplify that technology like the iPhone? I mean, it's amazing. When I first went to Kenya, I had to travel back to the capital every month, the first of every month to call my parents, to let them know I was okay. Now over 90% of the country has cell phone service. More people have access to the internet than to clean water. How can we leverage that like you're doing now with this podcast and the other things you do with Make a Dent? How can we do that with your career, with your creations, with your educational tools? I'm amazed, you know, on CyberSite, we have doctors who say, that was the most fun webinar I've ever had. I never thought I would be answering questions from 20, you know, countries at the end of one of my talks. You know, your, your, I think you said earlier, your podcast is now heard in 45, or I apologize, it was something like 45 countries. It's just think about how much reach you can have in your career and how we can leverage technology and networks to make what you do in cardiology help people around the world. So again, I just want to end by saying thank you. It's really been a pleasure uh, meeting you. And I hope the next time I come to Indianapolis to work with the CyberSight team, you and I can go out for dinner and I can uh, meet your wife, who's the ophthalmologist, and we can tell ophthalmology jokes all night long to the cardiologist. Oh, yeah, no, we we, we would love to host you for dinner, uh, you know, the next time you're in Indy. And, um, you know, thank you for... Uh... Thank you for your time and thank you for sharing your journey and your insights and, and your knowledge with us. And, you know, it's just been an absolute pleasure to host you on the show. Uh, thanks and, you know, hope to see you soon. We hope you enjoyed today's podcast produced by Radcliffe Cardiology in association with makeadent.org. We aim to bring you a new angle of all things cardiology every second week. Review us on your favourite podcast app or send your comments or questions to podcast at ratcliffe-group.com. To view the series, head to radcliffecardiology.com forward slash podcasts forward slash parallax. Thanks for listening.